Hello, JBS viewers. I'm David Harris, and this is Defending Israel. In nearly 50 years of advocacy, I've learned a few things about advocacy. I learned that you need smarts, you need courage, and you need eloquence. A couple of weeks ago, I was in London, England, and was asked to speak at a luncheon event. The other speaker was a young lady named Natasha Hausdorff a barrister in Britain. I was blown away by what I heard and by what I saw. And at the end of that luncheon, I asked Natasha if she would agree to appear here on Defending Israel. And I'm happy to say she has. And I'd like to introduce you, JBS viewers, to Natasha Hausdorff. Welcome. David, thank you. It's my pleasure to be with you. It was a great pleasure to meet you uh, in London, and I'm extremely grateful for your very kind words. Well, they're all sincere. No hyperbole, though Americans are often accused by the Brits, by the Brits, of exaggeration. Yeah. Natasha, let's go backwards first and talk to our viewers a little bit about your life and how Israel and Zionism also weaved itself into your life from an early age. Well, my family go back in the land of Israel, some eight generations. So Israel was always a, a big part of my life growing up in London. Uh, and I think it left me with a deep understanding, not just of the origins of the state of Israel in 1948, but its history and the huge uh, gulf that seems to exist between uh, reality and perception, unfortunately, outside of the Jewish state, uh, especially where I grew up in central London, uh, and the um, better sort of appreciation that I had of the realities, not just of the factual situation on the ground, but also as I uh, left school, went to university, uh, ended up studying law, the better appreciation I had of the gulf that existed between the legal realities and the misrepresentations. Um, and that is something that has clearly come to the fore in the last six months. So with the backing of, of I suppose, the in-depth um, knowledge that I had, um, all the way through my upbringing, um, my academic studies and my practice, um, my experience also uh, serving as a, a foreign clerk to the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in Jerusalem, uh, the late Miriam Naor, um, and my practice now, which takes me to an extent back and forth between Israel and London. All of that has uh, certainly empowered me to be able to address an awful lot of this new phenomenon that we're witnessing, uh, a phenomenon of lawfare, which I see as an abuse of international law specifically in order to demonize and misrepresent the situation uh, as uh, regards the state of Israel. There's a lot there. We have not, not a lot of time. So let me ask you then, because you've been a defender of Israel, both in the, the courts and um, on, on the media, let's take some of these accusations against Israel and see how you respond. First, of course, the biggest of them all, genocide. Well, I think we're experiencing a situation in which the allegations are becoming more and more fantastical. Um, and genocide is the latest evolution uh, in what I see as modern manifestations of ancient blood libels. Um, so it's inextricably linked with the, the sense of anti-Semitism or Jew hatred as a mutating virus. Uh, the ancient blood libels that focused on Christian children being killed to use their blood in, in Jewish religious rituals, I mean, those were widely believed in the Middle Ages. Um, the modern blood libels of uh, colonialism, ethnic cleansing, occupation, and now genocide are, it seems, as widely believed as the ancient blood libels were. But there's something deeply, deeply problematic and troubling, I think, in terms of where these blood libels have evolved. Because in the case of genocide, we are seeing an inversion of reality where the real victims 
of genocide, genocidal acts that were perpetrated against Jews in the south of Israel on the 7th of October. Uh, those victims of genocide are being essentially accused of the crimes that were perpetrated against them. Now, it's South Africa and the application that South Africa has brought essentially on, on behalf of the terror organization Hamas, an application brought to the International Court of Justice, which used this false allegation of genocide as a hook, a hook to be able to bring this case against Israel. That is the case because Israel is a signatory to the uh, International uh, Convention concerning the crime of genocide. So there's two aspects of, um, I think, South Africa's motivation for levying this allegation against Israel. The first is a technical one. Um, it's through this allegation that they've been able to uh, essentially bring Israel to the International Court of Justice. But the additional motivation, I think, here is that South Africa has changed the rules of the game. Um, there is certainly a, a propaganda aspect to the claim that has been brought. Uh, and the circus that we have seen play out at the International Court of Justice has engendered a situation where Israel and the term genocide, it seems, can now be used in the same sentence with some form of credibility. Um, that is extremely dangerous. It is factually and legally um, horrifically untrue. Uh, but nonetheless, they have definitely moved the needle and uh, underscored uh, an important aspect of this debate um, by using that term. So far as the legal definition of the crime of genocide is concerned, the critical aspect of this is an intention to destroy a group in whole or in part. Now, it's important historically to remember that this is a phrase that was coined by a Jew, Raphael Lemkin, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, to be able to provide a legal terminology to the horrific crimes that have been perpetrated against Jews especially. Uh, and in that context, I think it's even more egregious that Israel is being faced with this um, completely uh, false allegation. On the contrary, um, the Israel team at the International Court of Justice provided ample evidence of all of the measures that Israel takes to protect civilians in Gaza, specifically the humanitarian initiatives uh, and all of the uh, additional measures that Israel takes in uh, excess of the requirements of the laws of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, to protect civilians on the ground, even while Hamas is seeking to drive up the civilian casualty count and use ordinary Gazans as human shields. So in that context, the allegation is uh, even more egregious. Thank you, Natasha. Occupation. This is simply a reaction to occupation and legitimate resistance against occupation, Hamas and its supporters around the world claim. How, how do you respond? I think the first element of that that needs to be picked up upon is this allegation of occupation, which certainly has no legal basis, uh, as far as I'm concerned. It has certainly gained currency, gained traction as a political term, and it is one that is undoubtedly now adopted uh, by seemingly well-meaning governments around the world, even those that seek to present themselves as allies of the State of Israel. But the term occupation is predicated on a gross misrepresentation of international law. Um, for example, it completely... Uh, fails to apply basic rules of international law uh, that tell us the status of territory when new states are coming into being. Um, one key aspect of this, it's a customary rule of international law called uti possidetis juris. Now, uti possidetis juris is a universal rule. It is applied to all states emerging um, at their moment of independence as a default rule. So anytime there is no agreement to the contrary, uh, for example, a treaty between states that might delineate borders, where nothing like that exists, uti possidetis juris operates as a default to uh, provide certainty, 
stability um, and to prevent fratricidal struggles from erupting when new states are coming into existence. Those were the reasons given by the International Court of Justice when it recognized the emergence of this rule over a very long period of time a rule that emerged uh, in the 19th century, um, the uh, former sort of the decolonization process, um, and it applied in Asia, in Africa. It also applied at the dissolution of the former communist federations. And in fact, there's an important example I'll come back to in a moment, if I may, of uh, where the world does endorse the application of this rule. What does this rule tell us in Israel's case? Well, when Israel emerged as a state in 1948, it was the only state to emerge out of the British mandate or what was left of it after the severance of the uh, separate territory that became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, that was Transjordan. So what remained at the uh, withdrawal of the British in 1948, um, the eastern boundary of that territory ran all the way down uh, the Jordan River to the Red Sea. Uh, and that was the administrative line of the British mandate. Now, the rule of Utiposidetis Juris dictates that when a new state comes into being, it automatically inherits the pre existing administrative lines of whatever unit preceded it. And as the only state to emerge in 1948, the application of this rule dictates that Israel would have inherited the territory of the British mandate. Those administrative lines became Israel's international borders. Now, immediately thereafter, we have an invasion or attempted invasion, uh, the attempted annihilation of Israel by its surrounding Arab states. And Jordan occupies that territory, uh, which came to be known as the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And Egypt occupied Gaza. Fast forward to 1967, where in another war uh, that is forced upon Israel, uh, it recovers that territory, Gaza from Egypt, uh, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan. Um, I indicated a, a parallel example was, uh, was, was very important, and we have one in the case of Ukraine, because when Ukraine's borders were formed, it followed the rule of uti possidetis juris, and that is why there is a general consensus in the international community that uh, Crimea was part of Ukraine on the basis of that rule, and that Russia has occupied Crimea from Ukraine. Well, if um, Ukraine were to recover Crimea from Russia in the course of the war uh, that Russia has fought against Ukraine, if Ukraine were to recover that territory, I would warrant that very few, if any, right. people uh, of any substance would accuse Ukraine of having occupied Crimea from Russia. And yet, um, when we're faced with Israel's recovery of territory from Jordan in 1967, that is that is the allegation that is levied. It is another example of not just double standards in international law that are applied to Israel, but a, a complete inversion and an abuse of international law. So that's the first thing to understand so far as this allegation of occupation that is levied against Israel is concerned. There's a great deal more to discuss on that front in terms of the uh, application of the Fourth Geneva Convention, but, but I'll leave that perhaps for another discussion. Looking at that context and then just very briefly dealing with the second aspect of, uh, of, of the position that you've raised, which is this idea that the atrocities of the 7th of October can in some way be justified, even if we were to buy into this false narrative of occupation. Well, that is simply reprehensible. It is certainly uh, unprecedented. And it goes hand in hand, I'm afraid to say, with the real time Holocaust denial that we have seen. That the, that the atrocities of the 7th of October are, are seemingly on, on, on the one hand being celebrated by Hamas and its supporters and on the other hand being completely denied is just one of the um, mad aspects of this situation that unfortunately sensible, reasonable, rational people are having to contend with and the only response to that is to push back robustly. Natasha, starvation. That Mm. The accusation being that Israel is deliberately using starvation of Palestinian civilians as a tool of war. How would you respond? 
Um, well, again, uh, the facts of the situation uh, are clear and speak volumes. Since uh, the outset of Israel's operation uh, in the Gaza Strip, which has been called Iron Swords, um, there is a unit of the Israeli Defense Forces, Kogat, whose uh, sole uh, purpose is to provide for civilian populations in the context of armed conflict. And the uh, facilitation of aid by COGAT uh, has been closely documented. They put out frequent updates, briefings. They have a Twitter feed, or X as I believe it's now called, uh, where they post daily figures of the numbers of trucks, lorries, that have been uh, facilitated by COGAT. Currently, it's uh, both through the Nitsana crossing and the Kerem Shalom crossing. And the setup at the moment uh, by COGAT enables them to they have capacity to um, clear to check some forty four lorries of aid an hour. Now but, that is. But let me stop you, Natasha, for a moment. Yeah. So, if all of this is true and all of this is documented and all of this is in the open, why does the charge persist? Well, the allegation that Israel is failing in some way with respect to humanitarian aid or the more extreme version of that is following a policy of starvation, I can only put down to a, another blood libel. And we've seen, in fact, this one evolve even since this false allegation of genocide. It is totally at odds with the facts of the situation. It is a blood libel, unfortunately, that is, it seems is now being endorsed even uh, by the British Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron. I have an article on the Telegraph very recently calling out that falsehood. And we've heard time and time again the British Foreign Secretary calling Israel to turn the water back on, which um, presupposes a, it is based on the utterly false premise that Israel is withholding water from the Gaza Strip, um, which is not the case. And in, in fact, Israel's provision of water to the Gaza Strip before the 7th of October, was through some three pipelines that ran through the communities in the south of Israel to the Gaza Strip. It was only ever a, a small fraction, um, somewhere between the around 10% uh, estimates uh, lead us to believe. A small fraction of the water in the Gaza Strip was being provided by Israel um, before the 7th of October. Hamas attacked those pipelines and destroyed them. So once they had been reconnected, you know, repaired. Um, that water has continued. Uh, there is also water being provided on the humanitarian aid uh, trucks that Israel has been uh, clearing uh, to be provided to Hamas. Now, I, I do need to stress that Israel's obligations under international law are very clear. Its obligation to facilitate international aid into the Gaza Strip is predicated on a precondition, if you will, um, recognized in the Geneva Conventions that that aid will not be diverted to Hamas. And we know from the outset of uh, this latest round, this war, Iron Swords, uh, that Hamas has been diverting the humanitarian aid. That is one of the reasons it is so difficult to distribute the backlog of humanitarian aid that is currently sitting along the Gaza border having been cleared by Israel, um, that is sitting there and waiting for UN or other humanitarian organizations to seek to distribute it. I mean, the problems with distribution are, are uh, multifaceted. Uh, one aspect of it is that Hamas is diverting the aid. It uses what it can for its terror infrastructure and sells the excess on the black market at inflated prices. Uh, but the other aspect, of course, is the utter chaos that exists in the Gaza Strip. And we saw one example of that in the very tragic um, situation uh, of, a, of a crush and, uh, I believe, Egyptian uh, truck drivers who were afraid of being rushed by the crowd. Many of them have suffered severe injuries uh, through being um, beaten uh, by um, the population in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and that some of those truck drivers, it seems, drove over many desperate civilians that were seeking to get that aid. But Israel's responsibility, such that it is, is, uh, is being met and it has excess capacity. Uh, Natasha, let me ask you, uh, and we have just a few minutes left. I wish we had far more time. But drawing on your understanding both of international law and history, can you cite another example of a nation that was targeted 
by a state or non-state actor and that the international community is demanding of the target state to provide humanitarian assistance to the belligerent, as, as we're seeing now in the case of Israel and Hamas. It certainly did not happen in the Second World War. Yes, it's, it's not unusual, unfortunately, for um, completely unprecedented demands to be being made of Israel um, and, and, and for the, the normal situation, both in international law and international diplomacy, to be utterly inverted. Um, so, so the short answer is no. But on a, uh, if we're talking in general terms, to the extent that any entity is in occupation, uh, whereby it must have effective control, then there is an obligation uh, on the occupying force uh, to provide for a civilian population. And certainly uh, at a certain point in World War II, um, the Allied powers, when they came into effective control and occupation, would have uh, come under that obligation. What we see in the Gaza Strip, and it is very difficult to be able to assess, you know, as a as, a, as an international lawyer um, outside, not on the ground, but uh, certainly from what one can see, and the latest operation in Al Shifa uh, is a case in point. Al Shifa Hospital. Al Shifa Hospital. So Israel was was uh, in Al Shifa Hospital uh, some months ago in the north of Gaza. Um, there were some terrorists and, and ammunition found, uh, but Israel vacated that area. And by all accounts, um, Hamas and other terrorist organizations re-embedded themselves there. And there have been hundreds uh arrested or taken into custody uh, by Israel um, in recent days over the last week. So that is uh, indicative, unfortunately, of, of the way that Israel has had to fight this campaign very carefully, taking more precautions um, than any other army in the history of warfare. And you, you hear that from military specialists British military specialists like Colonel Richard Kemp, American uh, military specialists uh, like uh, John Spencer um, from the Center for Urban Armed Conflict at West Point, uh, who have reiterated this point. No other army, and even America, uh, and we've had American spokespeople indicating as much, put in the position that Israel has been uh, forced into, uh, America probably wouldn't be in a position to take the measures that Israel has been taking vis-a-vis -vis protection of the civilian population and a very slow method methodological process um, going house to house in many circumstances, seeking to navigate a civilian population that has uh, remained, that hasn't heeded Israel's pleas to evacuate according to the civilian humanitarian corridors that Israel has established to try and protect those civilians. Um, nonetheless, seeking to target Palestinian terrorist infrastructure in the Gaza Strip. And because of that, uh, it seems that Israel has not been in a position to gain effective control. Um, it therefore doesn't qualify for all of those additional obligations that might apply. Uh, but nonetheless, even in f as far as humanitarian aid is concerned, Israel is going above and beyond. And the allegations we have seen from the UN and from other humanitarian organizations, I can only say, are there to cover up their own failings, their own misdeeds, their complicity, it seems, with terrorism, and their complete incompetence when it comes to distributing the aid that Israel has already cleared uh, and is sitting in Gaza waiting to be sent to the civilians that need it. Natasha, I'm going to be very unfair to you. I'm going to ask you two or three big questions, but we only have about five minutes left. So unfair, but hopefully you'll give us the headline answer. Many expected that if this kind of eruption were to take place uh, in response to events in the Middle East, that France would be uh, ground zero. Instead, Britain has been ground zero uh, in Europe. Uh, people are asking now, does British Jewelry have a future? Or is its future going to be increasingly between higher walls uh, and, more, and, and more invisibility? Why is Britain ground zero today? And does British Jewelry have a, an optimistic future? Wow. Um, I try very hard not not to uh, prophesize um, because I think the end 
uh, answer to your question really depends on how things play out in the very immediate future. Um, currently, the situation uh, in London in particular um, and in the UK more generally is, is not a pleasant one. Um, there have been pro-terror, pro-Hamas marches on the streets on a weekly basis. Uh, and there seems to be a real reluctance um, by authority, the police, the mayor of London in particular, and um, even arguably the Home Office, to enforce existing law protections, not just for the Jewish community, but also for parliamentarians and for anyone that believes in Western liberal democratic values. Uh, public order offences, terrorism offences are um, essentially occurring on our our streets uh, with impunity because the police simply don't have the resources or the orders to properly deal with this. And combined with the British Broadcasting Service and the BBC uh, that is acting essentially as a Hamas propaganda mouthpiece, uh, anti-Semitism is at unprecedented levels and is rising exponentially. In that context, I can completely understand many in the Jewish community who say there is simply no future here for Jews. But the question has to be, you know, whether there will be a tipping point at some point. And um, arguably in, in other parts um, of, uh, of uh, Western uh, Europe, uh, that tipping point has been reached and there is a somewhat different approach. Um, we'll have to wait and see uh, whether uh, there is a, a desire to, um, to, to stand up and to defend our way of life in the West. Uh, from those that are seeking uh, to to do it and us harm. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not something uh, that I really have a, a handle on. And I think anyone who um, who suggests that they know exactly how all of this is going to uh, play out, well, perhaps needs to approach that with a little bit of caution. Uh, but I certainly do hope so, because to the extent that those that um, understand Israel's situation, appreciate where it is coming from, know that Israel is the bulwark uh, against Islamist fundamentalism, against Iranian proxies, where the aims of Iran, of Hezbollah, of Hamas, of ISIS uh, are essentially uh, to uh, wage their war not just against Israel, not just against the Jews, but against Western uh, democratic uh, examples all around the world and, and that way of life. If we understand that Israel is fighting the West's fight, uh, if you know, Jews and others who understand that essentially feel they have no choice but to leave places like the United Kingdom, there's going to be far less understanding here domestically of the realities of that situation. So I hope for you know, all of those reasons, it doesn't come to pass. I can only share the hope, Natasha, and of course here in the United States as well. But the fact that we even have to discuss it is itself a mm -hmm. sign of the times. Very quickly, since you mentioned the BBC, have you appeared on the BBC? since October 7th? Um, qu quite a few times. Um, I've even appeared on the BBC mm. since um, a, a, it seems, rather in, infamous interview with uh, Katya Adler uh, that caused a, a degree of consternation, not for about two and a half months after that, but since then, yes. Uh, many people ask me why I bother. Um, and it is true that uh, the coverage by the BBC has been utterly shameful. We have seen reports of Israel uh, summarily executing detainees. We have seen reports uh, also of, of, you know, that have been plainly shown to be um, factually incorrect, such as the 17th of October al Ahli hospital uh, bombing that Israel was uh, accused of, you know, all of that um, and no remorse, uh, no no even real apology, uh, despite the horrific um, effects that that sort of misreporting has. And in that context, uh, I think it's all the more important that if they ask me, um, I will continue to go on to at least provide um, a voice uh, that uh, speaks to the reality of the situation and challenges the, the appalling misreporting that we've seen so far. Natasha, thank you very much. I only wish we had more time. But JBS viewers, I said at the outset of this program, that to be an effective advocate, one needs to be smart, courageous, and eloquent.
And if we're looking for sources of hope in today's post-October 7th world, I hope this conversation with Natasha Hausdorff of London gives you some measure of hope. This is David Harris, Defending Israel. Am Yisrael Chai. Mm-hmm.